Our kind and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, once again we uh, come before you and just ask your blessings on this time together. As we get into your word together, Lord, may you give me the words that you would have to uh, tell your people this morning. May our, our hearts be uh, receptive to the, the message and uh, may we take from here uh, things that we need for our lives to be more like Christ in the way that we live and in the way that we conduct ourselves. Uh, watch over us, Lord, in this time together. May you be honored and glorified in all that is said and done. And as we go from here, Lord, may we, we uh, share the gospel with everyone we meet, every chance we get, while there's still time. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, you've probably heard this story before, the story of the fiery serpents. And I said, you probably thought I had coronavirus on the brain when I chose this passage, because we're, we're dealing with a plague of sorts in our country right now. Um, the overall effects, thankfully, don't seem to be very bad. Um, those who get it, um, it, it, at least from you know 50 years old on down, the effects are not terrible as illness goes, but it's spreading rapidly all over the planet. And for those who have existing uh, health issues, especially respiratory, um, the coronavirus can be a real problem. Um, so it's, it's, it's inconvenient for a lot of us in a lot of ways that everything is on lockdown, not just senior commons, but uh, my church is, uh, last Sunday, they, they did church kind of like we're doing it here on a screen. And it was nice, but it wasn't the same. Um, things are really different for us in our country uh, right now. So as, as we look at uh, what was going on with the Israelites, obviously certain, certain struggles that we are dealing with right now come to mind. Uh, but actually, what I wanted to look at this morning in this passage, one of the things that I've always marveled at with this particular passage is that all you had to do was look at that snake and you'd be cured who wouldn't you know it's 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 like it's so easy you could almost look at it by accident oh I, i'm healed <laughs> um it, it it is it is odd to me that all a person had to do was to look at this bronze serpent that moses made and they would be healed of the snake bite that they had gotten from these fiery serpents that had invaded the Israelite camp. Uh, but one of the things I noticed as I was reading through this passage uh, this past time in my Bible reading was what the Israelites did that God judged them with the fiery serpents in the first place. It wasn't so much something that they did. It wasn't that they engaged in idolatry or they intermarried with the Canaanites or you know, all the other things that they did eventually get into as time went on. Let's look in, and see in this passage again what it was that was going on in verse 4. It says, And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, meaning the manna that God had fed them with all along their journey. Now, stop and think for a minute. These people, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of shooting from off the top of my head here. I, I, I think it, it gives us to understand in Scripture, or scholars have estimated, uh, there, there were about 600,000 men that came up with Moses out of Egypt. And if each one of them had a wife and each family had children, um, scholars estimate that we're looking at about two million people that are roaming around in a desert. Now it's hard enough for one person or maybe a group of people to survive in a desert. You're looking at a small country moving around in a barren wasteland. Um, I've never been to the Holy Land, so I'm speaking only from what I see on maps and what I've read and so forth, but that wilderness that we call Saudi Arabia now, it is desert. There's nothing there. 
That's why, even though, if you look on a map, Ur of the Chaldees, right around where Babylon is located, is actually to the east of where the nation of Israel is by the uh, eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea, okay? Um, so the Babylonians, when they invaded Israel, they came from the north because you don't want to truck an army across a barren desert where there is nothing. They would have the Babylonian army, and I know I'm, I'm jumping ahead in Israel's history by several hundred years, but when the Babylonians invaded, they would have come up that uh, Mesopotamian region with uh, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River known as the Fertile Crescent. Sounds like a nice place to take a large group of people. And then they would come down from there into Israel through Galilee from the north, even though Babylon was to the east. So you remember reading in the Nativity story about how the wise men came from the east and Daniel was in Babylon. Um, but there's this desert between Babylon in the east and Israel, the, the land of Canaan in the west. And it was around in this, this great big wilderness that the nation of Israel was just wandering for 40 years. Two million people walking around. And it says in Scripture, their, their shoes did not wear out, their clothes did not wear out, their feet did not swell. God fed them with manna six days out of seven. On the sixth day, he gave them twice as much to last for seven days, or for all seven days, so they could have their day of rest. He provided a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and it gives us to understand in other places in Scripture, this pillar was not necessarily this, this column that you see depicted in artistry over top of the tabernacle in the middle of the camp. The, the, the fire and the cloud did focus on the tabernacle, but it was a covering to the people. I, I believe, and I'm shooting from memory here, it was in the book of Hebrews that it said all people, all the people of Israel passed under the cloud, um, giving us to understand that a cloud by day in the middle of a desert is a great thing because, you know, the desert is hot in the day and it's also freezing cold at night. The arid climate and absolute lack of cloud cover or any kind of trees or vegetation means the temperature is really extreme in the desert. Blazing hot by day, freezing cold by night. They had a pillar of cloud over top them by day and a pillar of fire over top them by night, providing light and heat. God literally covered his people and rained manna down from heaven to feed them for 40 years. These people were miraculously preserved for all of their journey. But as is often the case, and, and, and we can get after the Israelites for taking this attitude, but they were wandering around in a desert. And how do we do when we are provided with what we really need but it isn't exactly what we want. Yeah, if you ate the same kind of bread for 40 years, you'd probably be getting a little tired of it too. <laughs> so while we can look at the Israelites and kind of shake our heads and go, oh, come on, guys. I mean, look at all that God has done for you. In the moment, as one year leads to another and they're still in a desert because of their sin, uh, while they shouldn't blame God for that, you know, when, when you do something wrong and you suffer the consequences for it, you, you notice how the realization that it's your fault doesn't make you feel any better. <laughs> so you had two million people for 40 years knowing that they're wandering in the desert for 40 years because they lacked the faith to go into Canaan when God told them to. They're not in a good mood. They've had some battles. They've had some victories. God is kind of toughening them up. He's forging this group of wandering slaves into a solid nation, uh, but they're, they're still human beings and they're not in ideal circumstances and they're getting tired of this light bread. Our soul loatheth this light bread. So back to my original question, what was it the Israelites did? It wasn't anything that they did. It's something they thought. Is something they said. It was their attitude. God, we don't like how you're providing for us. We're getting tired of this. Ooh. 
So God sent judgment. He sent fiery serpents. And it may have been a natural phenomenon. It may have been a supernatural thing. I mean, they were in the middle of the desert. They could have wandered into a patch of, of fiery serpents. And just like our sin, the stuff that we do wrong, it's natural. It's there is a spiritual warfare going on, but sometimes we just do the wrong thing because we're human and we, we are not as good at following God as we ought to be. Um, the punishment God sent was sort of symbolic of what they had done. They were, they were ungrateful for what God did. They were starting to grumble with their mouths. And um, in, uh, in a certain uh, midrash, that's kind of a... A technical term. It's a body of knowledge, and, and I am I am no Hebrew scholar, but uh, there are are ancient books kind of surrounding Scripture that aren't a part of Scripture, but they're ancient commentaries by Jewish scholars from way back when. So there's there's a traditional body of knowledge that has been built up around Scripture, and it's included in in volumes like the Midrash. Um, makes reference to this event saying, Let the serpent who was the first to offend by evil tongue inflict punishment on those who were guilty of the same sin and did not profit by the serpent's example. So the